There are a handful of companies controlling the majority market share of almost 80% of the entire grocery items. Kraft currently sells at least 50 macaroni and cheese varieties. The regular Americans buy. The power, size and profit of these massive companies have, over the years, grown due to political lobbying and weak regulations that have allowed unchecked acquisitions and mergers, leading to a strong monopoly in the food processing industry. The effect cuts across the entire production chain, allowing these mega companies to largely dictate what America's 2 million farmers grow and how much they are paid, as well as what consumers eat and how much groceries cost. One such company is Kraft Heinz, the third largest food and beverage company in North America and the fifth largest in the world. With over 20 renowned brands under its belt, this is the story of how Kraft Heinz monopolized the food industry. Actually, what I said was we paid too much for Heinz. Um, uh, I mean, Kraft, I'm sorry. We at Business Chronicles tell extraordinary business stories. Please subscribe to our channel to help us make more videos. The early beginnings of the Kraft Heinz company can be traced back centuries before a merger brought the Kraft and Heinz family businesses together. Kraft Food Incorporation was originally founded in 1909 by James Lewis Kraft and his four brothers, who named it G.L. Kraft & Bros. Prior to that, in 1903, James Kraft started a wholesale door-to-door -door cheese business in Chicago after he just immigrated to the United States from Ontario, Canada. In 1912, the company founded its New York City headquarters in preparation for further expansion on their international market. Two years later, in 1914, there was 31 varieties of cheese being sold in the United States due to the heavy product development, expanding market, and an opening of a wholly owned cheese factory in Stockton, Illinois. To further gain an advantage in the market, Kraft Foods devised a plan to invest in pasteurized processed cheese in 1915, giving it an extended shelf life than the traditional cheese on the market. In 1916, the company secured a patent for the product and sold about 6 million pounds of the product to the United States Army for its military rotation during the First World War. The sales led to increased national advertising for the company that saw it make its first acquisition a Canadian cheese company, a move that marked the start of its century-long dominance in the food industry. In 1924, the company changed its name to Kraft Cheese Company and was officially listed on the Chicago Stock Exchange. In 1926, it was listed on the NYSE as it began to consolidate the United States dairy industry through acquisition. In competition with the National and Borden, over a two-year period from 1927 to 1929, Kraft Cheese Company acquired 10 companies including Southern Dairy, Phoenix Cheese, and Galfan Manufacturing. After the Kraft Cheese Company acquired the National Dairy in 1930, the company had a sales record of $315 million, compared to the $85 million Kraft had. So, the management of the National Dairy ran the combined business. After the Kraft Phoenix acquisition, the company was called the National Dairy until 1969, when it changed its name to Kraft Co. Interestingly, most of the firm's sales came from its dairy products. However, the company decided to diversify its product line from dairy products to caramel candies, cheese dinners, macaroni, and margarine, before eventually moving on from low-value added commodities dairy products like fluid milk until the final and primary leading dairy product it produced was cheese. That's how the company's modern history emphasized the cheese history. By 1980, Kraft merged with Dart Industries, the markers of Duracell batteries, West Bend brand of home appliances, Tupperware brand of plastic containers, Thatcher glasses, and Wilson Art brand of plastics. After the merger, the company was renamed Dart & Kraft. The company continued to expand with new acquisitions in the food processing industry, like Lander's Bagels, Journey Premium Cheeses, and Fruits and Glitch Ice. In 1988, Kraft sold Duracell to private equity firm Koelberg Kravis Roberts, who then put it into an initial public offering in 1989. While Gillette brought Duracell in 1996 and was acquired by Procter & Gamble in 2005. On the other hand, the H.J. Heinz company was founded by Henry J. Heinz in 1869. The company manufactured several thousand food products on six continents, marketing them in over 200 countries. Henry Heinz began his journey when he was packing foodstuff in Shapesburg, Pennsylvania in 1869. It was at the same time he founded Heinz Noble & Company with a close friend L. Clarence Noble. With both of them marketing horseradish, the company's first product was Heinz Mother and a Heinz recipe for horseradish, a product he manufactured in the basement of his father's previous house. 
His company didn't last long, as it went bankrupt in 1875. However, the following year Heinz started a new company with his brother, John, and cousin, Frederick Heinz. They named it FNJ Heinz, and one of the first products was tomato ketchup, a product that ensured the company would continue to grow. In 1888, Heinz brought out its two new company partners and renamed it H.J. Heinz with the slogan 57 Varieties. The slogan was inspired by an advertisement they saw while riding an elevated train in New York City. The ad was a shoe store boasting 21 styles, so Heinz picked the number more or less at random because he liked the sounding of it. Selecting 7 specifically because, as he puts it, of the psychological influence of that figure and of its enduring significance of people of all ages. In the early 20th century, H. G. Heinz was incorporated and Heinz served as its first president, holding that position for the rest of his life. While he was president, the company started the processing of sanitary food preparation and also successfully lobbied efforts to favor the 1906 Pure Food and Drug Act. In 1908, Heinz opened a processing plant in Leamington, Ontario, for tomatoes and other products. The processing plant was operated until 2014, when it was eventually sold. Heinz's vision and pioneering efforts were one of the reasons why the company flourished under his reign. His scientific and technological innovations helped solve problems like bacterial contamination. He personally spearheaded the work to control the purity of his products by managing all of his employees. At the start of World War I, he worked with the Food Administration. Henry Heinz died shortly after the end of the war in 1919. During the Second World War, his grandson, Jack Heinz, became the company's president and acted as the CEO to aid the United Kingdom and cushion the shortage of his food. Its Pittsburgh plant was then converted to manufacture gliders for the War Department. In the years after the war ended, Jack Heinz expanded the company's operation to establish processing plants in different countries overseas. Increasing the international presence of the Heinz company, he also acquired Orida and Starkist Tuna. However, the company started facing a decline by 2000 due to the consolidation of grocery store chains, increased competition for shelf space by the growth of private label brands, and the fast spread of big retailers like Walmart. The company's decline was also due to its poor response to the board demographic changes in the US, particularly the increased spending power of African Americans and the growth of population among Hispanics. Entering into the 21st century, the Kraft and Heinz businesses continued to see a huge success, occasional setbacks, and a strong competition until 2005, when they decided to team up and take major control in the food processing business. The merger of Kraft Food and H.J. Heinz, which was agreed by the board of directors of both companies and approved by shareholders and the regulatory authorities in 2015, both companies have laggard brands, uh, brands that we might have grown up with, but brands that, frankly, Generation Z and Millennials don't like. Mark the start of the Kraft Heinz monopoly. The deal saw investors 3G Capital and Berkshire Hathaway team up to create the new Kraft Heinz company, which they held a 51 stake in. Since it was a publicly traded company, the other shareholders of Kraft held the remaining 49 of Kraft Heinz. In addition, it was agreed that each share held by the Kraft Foods company before the merger would be equal to one share to the new company, and the additional shareholders would also receive dividends totaling $10 billion, which was equal to about $16.50 per share. The amount was paid by both 3G Capital and Berkshire Hathaway. In reaction to the deal, the chairman and CEO of Berkshire Hathaway, Warren Buffett, said, this is my kind of transaction, uniting two world-class organizations and delivering shareholder value. I'm excited by the opportunities for what this new combined organization will achieve. With the new vision in place, the firm's expectations were large, as shareholders anticipated large returns, decreased costs, and a larger influence around the world. After the merger, Bernard Hees, CEO of Heinz prior to the merger, was appointed CEO of the newly formed Kraft Heinz Company, while Alex Baring was appointed chairman and John Cahill, Kraft's CEO before the merger, was appointed vice chairman. The newly formed company became the fifth largest food and beverage company in the world and the third largest in the United States. With its headquarters located at the Annan Center in Chicago and at the PPG Palace in Pittsburgh and several other offices across the US, Canada, Europe, South Africa, Australia and Asia. When the merger was completed in 2015, it did not immediately affect the naming rights to Heinz Field in Pittsburgh, home of the Pittsburgh Steelers. However, 
Leaked reports later show that the company didn't renew the rights which Heinz initially acquired in 2001. For all the fears of an early dominance in the possible monopoly market that surrounded the merger, Kraft Heinz didn't have a smooth sailing at first. Security regulators first looked into its accounting, and after a conducted internal investigation, it was uncovered that the company had committed employee misconduct. Kraft Heinz later made it known that it would restate its financials for 2016 and 17, while it was also facing several lawsuits. The company was soon forced to lay off thousands of its workforce in the last four years, while announcing more job cutoffs in the second season of August 2019. For Warren E. Buffett, Berkshire Hathaway and the Brazilian-based investment firm 3G Capital, the deal to merge both companies looked like a huge and costly misstep. Contrary to their earlier acquisitions, which have produced huge returns, Kraft Heinz created over a billion dollar paper loss. The company's stock dropped by 51 in over a year, leading to Brazilian-based investment firm 3G Capital selling off over 25 million of its shares, bringing its stake in the company down by over 10%. At the time, former employees of the company and some analysts put the blame at the feet of the Brazilian-based investment firm 3G Capital and its use of a highly boastful zero-based budgeting strategy that critics say focuses more on cutting costs than creating products that people want to buy. Some other analysts also noted that the company's margins and profit are way much higher than its peers at General Mills and Kellogg. They argued that Kraft Heinz was facing similar headwinds to other large packaged good companies who were struggling to adapt as its consumers turned to healthier and often organic food. In most of its deals, the strategy of the Brazilian-based investment firm 3G Capital was simple. Slash expenses, improve profitability and typically increase revenues by acquiring other companies. The zero-based budgeting tactic of the firm required managers to prove every expense they took annually and not just build on the budget of the previous year. After the merger between Kraft and Heinz, Bernardo Hees, a Brazilian economist who had led Burger King, became chief executive of the combined company. He told analysts that the merger would yield $1.5 billion in annual cost cuts in the future. While most people cheered the return to prominence of the Kraft Heinz company, one area they failed to look at was the looming danger of the economic monopoly in the food processing industry, one which would give Warren Buffett's Berkshire Hathaway and Brazilian 3G Capital Ventures company Kraft Heinz a controlling stake in the industry. For starters, the merger meant that Kraft Heinz now had about 60 smaller brands under its belt. Some of them included renewed brands like ABC, Baker's Chocolate, Corn's Nuts, Heinz Ketchup, Kraft's Diner, Jell-O, Maxwell House, Shake and Bake, Volvetta, and Capri Sun, which now has sold in over 100 countries with 7 billion pouches sold yearly as of 2016. In addition, other brands parts of the company's profile includes Boca Burger, Givalia, Grey Popoon, Oscar Mayer, Philadelphia Cream Cheese, Primal Kitchen, and Watties, eight of which have totaled individual sales of over $1 billion. As a result of owning these numerous brands, the merger meant that the global food production industry was in the hands of about half a dozen companies. These six multinational powerhouse companies, including Kraft Heinz, have enormous power over the retail grocery channel and supply chain, and by extension, they control the dynamics of food access, an area that is necessary for everyone. Kraft Heinz and the remaining five corporations represent the rise of monopoly in an industry where it's supposed to be a healthy competition. Arguably, the industry needs more competitiveness than any other industry worldwide. The future forecast for the industry will be an interesting one to look out for, because the magnitude of the merger prevents Kraft Heinz from completing any new purchases of brands for the new future. However, the completion of the deal's regulatory process made it more positioned to make more acquisitions of other competing food brands. An example was seen in February 2017, when the company launched a 143 billion bid to take over renowned British-Dutch multinational company Unilever, which was a much larger competitor with over 126,000 employees and a 24 billion pounds revenue margin than Kraft Heinz. Unilever rejected the initial proposal and the takeover was eventually abandoned some days later when the UK Prime Minister Theresa May ordered the deal to be scrutinized. The company announced later that year, in October, that it was acquiring Cerebus Pacific, including the Greggs, Pesito and Saxa sold brands. The purchase was eventually approved by New Zealand's Commerce Commission on the condition that Kraft Heinz would sell the licenses for Greg's brand of sauces and the F. Whitelock Worcestershire sauce due to worries from competitors.
As its dominance continued, Kraft Heinz again expanded its operation in May 2018. Kraft Heinz Co. launched a business that was focused on growing organic, natural and super premium food brands, and they called it Springboard Brands. Later that year, Kraft Heinz announced that it was going to acquire the Primal Kitchen brand to be part of the company's Springboard Incubator. The deal was worth $200 million and was completed in 2019, with an expectation to generate around $50 million annually in revenue. A deal that further showed how much of a frightening monopoly system Kraft Heinz was building. To keep up with the monopolized industry, market and supply chain, other brands had to go rogue. As celiac disease rose in the industry, along with increased awareness of food allergens and wellness trends, privately owned companies in the national food area got a window of opportunity to challenge large-scale manufacturing companies like Kraft Heinz. Some examples of this scenario included Food for Life, Chibani, and most recently, Enjoy Life. Before its brand was acquired by Mondelez International, formerly Kraft's snack food division, the deal showed the value of allergen-free product lines in the new American consumer consciousness. The largely owned private company soon entered the grocery store channel and began to compete well with some established players, as evident in Chibani's ability to get a large part of the market share from yogurt-heavy ways, Uplate and Danon. Considering the cost of refrigerated shelf space, doing so against the heavy ways isn't easy. The rapid increase in gluten-free food has led to a better food industry consolidation, including the approach used by General Mills. So in order to compete with smaller companies that produce high-quality gluten-free and allergen-free products, General Mills launched its products, offering some quality in those areas, and also created line extensions brands to include gluten-free options for consumers. That way, they were able to complete and capitalize on the emerging food industry trend without having to commit more resources, like acquiring a new brand, which is quite costly in terms of time and finance. While this method of going rogue did work for some small brands, the monopoly already created by Kraft Heinz merger, along with other powerhouse companies, often proved too big to handle. So the formula for a very combustible situation such as this was the skyrocketing cost of staple food products coupled with the shrinking middle class and further food consolidation. The average worker had experienced flat wages without or with little cost of living increase and an increase in the cost of basic food items let alone the health or organic food options, leading to food insecurity. Several regions in the United States have already seen an increase in demand for services from food pantries and other forms of assistance. More so, the alarming nature of the merger between Kraft and Heinz created a potential for both companies' expertise as well as access to their newly combined capital that allows them to create multiple conditions where these rogue privately owned companies will find it extremely difficult to thrive or even survive. The acquisition potential for Heinz Kraft extends even to larger companies that are struggling, such as Campbell Soup Company, Con Agra, and cereal giant Kellogg. The high costs associated with shelf space in the grocery store channel and the fact that big industry players like Kraft Heinz control the premium spaces meant that they are creating a strong monopoly in the industry. So here's how it works. The big monopoly companies are often helped by so-called category captains representing big manufacturers or brands and work with retailers in deciding who or which products gets the most prominent spot on supermarket shelves. But that's not Ola. There are also slot fees paid by the big companies in return for an eye-catching placement for their products, making it very difficult for new and independent brands to make a breakthrough. And even if they do, it doesn't last long. For example, while old-school beer enthusiasts and hipsters have contributed to the booming nature of the local craft beer industry, the Belgian company Anheuser-Busch in Bev bought about 17 formerly independent craft breweries from 2011 to 2020. It might be vague to consumers from the labels, but Anheuser-Busch owns over 600 brands, including the masses' favorite, Budweiser, Michael Lobb, and Bex. The economic power of large monopoly business like Kraft Heinz has also contributed to their growth among political elites leading to lows that often profit them rather than focus on food and worker safety, sustainability and consumer rights. According to The Guardian, during the 2020 election cycle, the food industry spent $175 million on political contributions, including lobbying by PACs and individuals and other efforts. The money came from every part of the food chain, including dairy, eggs, poultry, meat processing, farm bureaus, sugarcane, crop production and supermarkets. 
About two-thirds went to the Republicans. The 2020 total compares to just $29 million spent during the 1992 election cycle, which means lobbying by the food industry had increased by sixfold, and that was in less than three decades, as consolidation across the supply chain has boomed. But what about the supermarket chain's dominance? The low competition among food processing businesses means a higher price for products and fewer choices for consumers, including places where they can shop for food items. Most people bought good items in regional or local grocery stores until the 1990s. Now, just for companies, Walmart, Costco, Kroger, and Ajo Del Hayes control 65% of the retail market, a similar situation with Kraft Heinz and others. According to the U.S. Census Bureau, corporate consolidation can drive up food prices and reduce access to food. Supermarket mergers drive out smaller mom-and-pop grocers and regional chains. We have roughly one-third fewer grocery stores today than we did 25 years ago. Fortunately, the Federal Trade Commission was concerned about the possibility of industry monopoly in the United States decades ago with the Bell Telephone monopoly that led to famous creation of the baby bells. But most recently, the antitrust movement has been more focused on the energy energy and airline industry. However, when it comes to access to food products, Kraft Heinz's creation of a monopoly has caused a dangerous scenario with far-reaching consequences. The over-reliance of food industry on globally sourced commodities create a pause in many minds. When they realize that six or seven large conglomerates like Kraft Heinz control the supply of finished products available to the masses. If you enjoyed this video, do leave a like and subscribe to this channel for more interesting stories and hidden secrets about your favorite companies, families, and people.